I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. As you know, we're here this afternoon for the announcement of the winner of the Man Booker International Prize at the Sydney Writers' Festival. Many noteworthy things happen here at the Sydney Opera House, from Oprah to Ashkenazi to Lou Reed and Laurie Anderson's Vivids Festival. But for me, as the person who's responsible for our talks program and the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, this afternoon's event and the Sydney Writers' Festival events throughout the week are some of the ones closest to my heart. So I'm very happy to be able to introduce to you the busiest man in Sydney, Sydney Writers' Festival Artistic Director, Chip Rowley. Thank you very much, Anne, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, today at this um, auspicious occasion. Um, a little bit of context is, is necessary. I mean, Sydney Writers' Festival, as Anne has told you, is taking place this week. We had our opening address last night with Fatima Bhutto, um, so we've started off well, and tomorrow we really get kicking into gear with all of our events at, down at Walsh Bay and at other venues around Sydney. The um, relationship with the um, uh, Sydney Writers' Festival and the Man Booker Prize is an interesting one. Man Investments is one of our treasured sponsors. It is one of the, um, the groups uh, uh, that actually make the festival happen. And um, we're always grateful to our sponsors. But what comes with Man Investments is obviously a, a, an interesting partnership that is um, spinning out in some very interesting ways this week. Man Investments um, has been such a critical part of the festival, and the festival has been engaged with the Booker Prize, the Man Booker Prize, for a number of years. We often have the Man Booker Prize at the festival, and we will again this year. Howard Jacobson, the winner of the 2010 Man Booker Prize, is a guest of the festival, and you all should check out the guide online um, to make sure that you see his events. But this year, we've obviously got something very special, the announcement of the Man Booker International Prize. And this follows, uh, back in March 30th, the University of Sydney hosted the judges of the Man Booker International Prize, uh, Rick Joukowsky, who you'll hear from in a minute, Carmen Khalil, and Justin Cartwright, when they hashed out and worked and deliberated and came up with their list of 13 um, uh, uh, finalists for the prize. And today, we of course get to find out who is the ultimate winner of the Man Booker International Prize. The person who will be doing this is the chair of judges for the Man Booker International for 2011, and that's Dr. Rick Joukowsky. Rick and I met last year at the Sydney Writers' Festival. He was a guest of the festival, um, talking mostly about his book, Outside a Dog. I think Rick and I had an instant affinity for each other. He's an American who calls the UK home. I'm an American who calls Australia home. And um, I th perhaps it's through that that um, we got along really well. And um, Rick is, um, many of you will know because of his time with us last year, um, his background. He's um, one of the world's leading bookmen. And one of, the, one of the interesting things about Rick is he's a writer. He's a writer. Um, but he's also one of the in most interesting readers. Of, of, of fiction and nonfiction. He, he's a columnist. He is a book dealer of rare manuscripts. Um, he is an all around uh, raconteur who can tell you interesting facts about every single thing that you might have read and everything that you certainly didn't read. And um, we're, we're very lucky to have him again at the festival this year. And we're very lucky to have him today. I don't want to hold you any longer. I want to call Rick to the stage, the chair of the judges so that we can all be put out of our um, very intense curiosity and find out who the winner of the 2011 Man Booker International Prize is. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Dr. Rick Joukowsky. Thank you all and welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, to Chip, it's total joy to be back in Sydney again. I had such a good time at the festival last year, and it never occurred to me that I could do it again. It's utterly wonderful being here. To be in this venue, which is clearly one of the great settings of the world, is particularly enjoyable and thrilling, and particularly appropriate, I think, for the awarding and the announcement of the winner of one of the great literary prizes of the world. Now, for those of you who need a little background on this, the Man Booker International Prize began in the year 2005. It's given every two years 
And the rubric is curiously vague. It simply awards and recognizes a, an achievement in fiction. And that is to any living fiction writer in the world who either writes in English or is translated into English. And given that any foreign writer who's any good will be translated into English, that means it can be awarded to anybody in the world who writes fiction. It's a very daunting task, and I think all of us were aware um, of how much work and responsibility it would be to do it. In 2005, it was given to Ishmael Kadare. In 2007, to that great novelist Chinua Achebe. In 2009, to Alice Munro. I had the great pleasure and benefit of wonderful cohorts, contemporaries, judges, in Carmen Khalil, who's clearly one of the most distinguished publishers of her generation, and a woman of enormous acuity, who in football terms, you often say of midfield players who can run about, they have a great engine. Um, as a reader, Carmen has an amazing engine. I've never seen somebody cover so much of the field so accurately and well. And Justin Cartwright, who is, of course, an enormously respected novelist, winner of the Whitbread Prize, shortlisted for the Booker Prize, as well as an extremely good and acute observer of contemporary literature as a reviewer. Um, it was an honor to work with them and to try to keep up with them. It's interesting, there's a kind of nice coincidence. In 2005, when the first international prize was given, I was judging the annual Booker Prize. And I was rather shocked when I was asked to judge it by Martin Goff, who was then the administrator. Took me out to lunch and I said, fine, will you tell me what the rules are? And Martin said, there aren't any rules, pick the best book. And one of the things that I adore about working, as it were, for and with the Man Booker group is how much they trust their judges. Equally, for the international prize, when I said, tell me what the rules are, they said, reward and achievement in fiction. There are no rules. There are no submissions. You and Justin and Carmen go off and read and read and talk and talk and come up with the winner. And this afternoon, I'm delighted to be able to announce that winner. When I started, when I was first asked by Fiametto Rocco, our most excellent administrator, would I take the chair for this, after about 10 minutes of very intense self-doubt, I kind of said, yahoo, and I will do that with pleasure. And I have done it with pleasure. And I went out, I was in New Zealand at the time, and I went down to the local bookstore, and I thought, must start reading, can't stop for a minute, what will I read? And I thought, I looked around, saw what I found. And I found Rohinton Mysteries' novel, A Fine Balance. Perhaps those of you who haven't read it have such a treat in store. 1996, shortlisted for the Booker Prize, didn't win, should have won. Carmen was the chairman at the time. All kinds of odd coincidences. And I took this novel home, and I was absolutely bowled over by it. And I thought to myself that in some way, this sets a standard. What is the standard? One, we're looking for a great writer. Two, one of the ways you tell a great writer is he can produce a masterpiece, or she can. What is a masterpiece? People keep saying to me, what were your criteria? And as for what a masterpiece is, I don't know, but I recognize one when I see one. If you said to me, Rick, define a horse, I would take you to a paddock. If you want me to define a masterpiece, let's read Crime and Punishment, or Nostromo, or Ulysses together, and that's what one of them looks like. So the criterion is this. We're looking for a great writer, and we're looking for a writer who, at the top of their game, produces work of enduring value. That is, work that we hope will be read, and believe that will be read, in 100 years' time. And at that point, we started to get to work, and we agreed that we would test to strength. Because I think it's always a mistake to say, well, writer so-and-so has written some good books, but some bad books. I'm only interested in how good the person is at the top of their game. Uh, think of William Wordsworth. If you ever have the hideous responsibility to read the collected works of Wordsworth, it's astonishing how terrible most of them are, except there's a dozen poems which are magisterially wonderful, and that makes Wordsworth a great poet. That is, we don't homogenize an author's work. We see what cream rises to the top, and we judge from there. 
great writer, enduring work, judged on the best things possible. It was a good way to start, I think, and we all agreed that was, that was a way to go. We then started with a list of two or 300 world novelists, and the idea was to set up a process in which you funneled it down until at the very end of the process, a small number came out. And that was the list of finalists that I announced last month at the University of Sydney, to whom we're still and continually grateful for their hospitality and support. And I would like, just if I may, before announcing the winner, to take you quite quickly through that list and to make a small comment about each of them. At the same time, for those of you, I keep getting asked by, when I'm doing this job, tell me what to read, what should I read? So I'm gonna make a suggestion from each of the authors, reminding you at the same time that they're not being awarded the prize for that book. It's for an entire life's work, as it were. So, the list of finalists, and I'll take them alphabetically, from China was Wang Ani. And in Carmen's words, her irony and her daring exploration of sexual love demonstrates how clearly and how many different ways there are to challenge an authoritarian state. I think Wang Ani is wonderful because she's writing about the Cultural Revolution, but she's writing about it from the kitchen and from the sitting room and from the workplace and from the bedroom. It's all seen in minute detail in family life, and you understand more about the Cultural Revolution, I think, than if you read a history of it by some political scientist. The book to read, I think, The Song of Everlasting Sorrow like, is like Madame Bovary. It's a masterpiece. It's quite wonderful. Juan Goiti Solo from Spain is a great a great opponent of Spain and everything it stands for. He's lived uh, in Morocco most of his life, and he, he's looking really to destroy Spanish mythology, Catholicism, nationalism. It's a literary attack on traditional Spain, and it's written in a quite extraordinary, kind of slightly postmodern language, which is utterly fascinating. And Justin, I think, particularly wanted to recommend The Garden of Secrets. James Kelman makes his second appearance on list, this list. He won the Booker Prize in the annual Man Booker Prize in, two th in 1994 with How Late It Was, How Late. And he writes about the downtrodden, really, the dispossessed of Scottish society. But through that kind of very narrow lens, you get an extraordinary study of the human heart. Sorry about that. Now, John le Carre is an interesting case because when we announced John le Carre's name, he announced that he did not wish to be considered any further, and he was not. But we still like him anyway. <laughs> Every novel is a pleasure to read, each one eloquent with an urge towards the faint possibility of justice in a naughty world. And our description, I think, of the Cold War is filtered through the lens of John le Carre. We think we know a lot about the Cold War, but what we really know a lot about is John le Carre. Uh, if you haven't read The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, you should be shamed and go out and do it tomorrow. It's a totally wonderful book. Amin Malouf, Lebanese writer who now lives in Paris, has a fiction that is enormously, panoptically wide-ranging. It has a deep understanding of unfamiliar and lost cultures, clashes of civilizations, the relationship between the Christian and the Arab and the Muslim world, uh, mostly seen in the 16th and 17th centuries. And I absolutely adore the book called Balthazar's Odyssey, uh, be perhaps because it's about a rare book dealer uh, chasing a book of which there's only one copy. Um, he gets it right. Very few people who write about the rare book trade get it right. And Malouf gets that right, and he gets everything else right as well. Wonderful writer. David Malouf is one of my favorite writers. I adore his work. He has what I think of as a poet's sensibility, but there's nothing somehow brazenly poetic about his writing. And I'm constantly astonished reading him by the vivacity and the accuracy of his writing. It's impossible to read a page of David Malouf without a smile of delight and a smile of gratitude. And I'm particularly pleased that he's here today. Um, he's a great short story writer, or you might look at Remembering Babylon, which won the Impact Prize in 1993. Dacia Marini is an Italian feminist writer who started in the 1960s 
and she has great dramatic power and political power. She's a feminist, she's a political activist, she has very strong left-wing sympathies, but she's never politically correct, and her characters are never functions of her ideas. The ideas somehow get generated out of the characters. Um, there's a wonderful historical novel of hers called The Silent Duchess, which if you don't know it, you should. Rohinton Mystery started me on this long pilgrimage and is the only writer to this day, all of whose novels, at least all, any writer who's written more than one, all of whose novels, that's three, have been shortlisted for the annual Man Booker Prize. He has a great eye and a huge heart and if the world he describes is cruel and capricious, his characters have a tremendous capacity to survive. I think he's a wonderful writer, and a fine balance is terrific. I was particularly pleased that Philip Pullman came into the list, because we were twice told, once with Le Carre and once with Pullman, that these are genre writers. One is a thriller writer, the other is a writer for children. And I wanted very much to resist that notion. It seems to me these are simply great novelists, great writers, by the criteria that I've adduced already. And Pullman, I love his anti-clericalism. And who writes like that for children? It's extraordinary. His respect for the body are the kind of animating forces of the narrative. And his Dark Materials is, is clearly not a book for children any more than Gulliver's Travels is. And it has, I think, the same imaginative power. So you would want to read the trilogy. The other books are, are merely good books. Anne Robinson is an interesting choice, I think, because she's only written three novels. And it's an interesting question. Can you compare somebody who's only written three novels with somebody who, like Philip Roth, has written 33 novels? The answer is, testing to quality, each one of Anne Robinson's novels is a masterpiece. Each one has a tiny focus, and the tiny focus somehow widens out until what you learn about is about the drama of being human. I think she's marvelous. Uh, you could read any of those three because they're all equally good, but I prefer Home of the Three. Philip Roth has had an extraordinary career trajectory. His first book is 1959. It's Goodbye Columbus, acknowledged by everybody to be a masterpiece, won the National Book Award. Saul Bellow said, oh my god, where did he come from? He's so good. He then continues to get better and better. And in his 50s, 60s, and early 70s, when many novelists have mined the core, the seam of their material, he's writing masterpiece after masterpiece. They're utterly extraordinary. And in 2010, 51 years after Goodbye Columbus, he wrote Nemesis, which is, I think, as good as anything he's ever done. Su Tong is a Chinese writer who's written five novels, is wonderfully witty and funny, very dark. The novel I would recommend to you is Rice, which is, I think, the most unredeemedly bleak novel I've ever read. And yet you put it down and you say, that was great. And I've been trying to work out how he did that ever since. And I don't know what the answer is. He's a kind of master of implication. And the more you read and the more carefully you read Su Tong, the more you learn about the state of modern China. Wonderful writer. Anne Tyler has been around for a long time. I did a foolish thing, I think, when I was in New Zealand and I started reading. I read 10 Ann Tyler's in 10 days. And you're not supposed to do that with writers. You're supposed to mix and match them a bit and kind of have a bit of this and a bit of that. And every one was marvelous to read. I enjoyed them so much. I would, she, she has a kind of amused and sympathetic voice and a, a generosity of spirit which is so profound that it seems to me just to count as a form of love. You might look at dinner at the homesick restaurant um, or the amateur marriage. They're both very, very good. Those are our list of finalists. And I think in each case, the criteria that we began with were fully met. These are great writers. At their best, they write absolutely great, enduring works of fiction. And as I've said before, 
It's no easy task to choose between them, and I can assure you it wasn't. We talked and talked and talked, and it took many hours of strenuous debate. But in the end, I'm delighted to announce that the winner of the Man Booker International Prize for 2011, in my view, a giant figure in world fiction, is Philip Roth. I would like to thank the judges of the Man Booker Prize for awarding me this esteemed prize. One of the particular pleasures I've enjoyed as a writer is to have my work read internationally, despite all the heartaches of translation that entails. I hope the prize will bring me to the attention of readers around the world who are not familiar with my work. This is a great honor, and I'm delighted to receive it. It was our hope at one point that Philip Roth might be able to be with us, but he's had several operations on his back and is really in no state to travel. Um, he's with us in his words and the quality of his work, and I'm, it's, and I, I must admit, speaking perfectly frankly now and personally, that is one of the happiest moments of my life to be able to sit here and to name Philip Roth, who I have read for 45 years, and to acknowledge him as the great writer that he is. I'm absolutely thrilled to be doing it. Um, I think we could take some questions. Do you want to, Chip, do you, do you want to do that? Yeah. So I'll just be um, the pointer. So hands up, who wants to ask a question of Rick Tchaikovsky? If there are any questions about process or about um, any of the debate that might have ensued to get to this um, uh, uh, winner, Mark McAvoy. Uh, Mr. Joukowsky, what distinguished Philip Roth from the others on the shortlist? Uh, to my mind, it's the length, the trajectory, and the depth of the career. Um, it is very hard comparing people, for instance, like Su Tung who, or Rohinton Mystery, who are in mid-career, with people like Philip Roth, who are really at the end of their career. But I can't think, I'd be very happy to be told if I'm wrong about this, I can't think of anybody who's written what I think of as masterpieces 50 years apart. And I can think of very, very few novelists, I could name one or two, I think, but I won't, um, who get better and better and better as they go into middle and late middle age. Usually, novelists, the trajectory for novelists tends to be upward, keeping up for a while, and then heading downwards again. And I think the trajectory of Philip Roth's career uh, added to the sheer quality of it and the pleasure that one gets from reading him made him, for me, stand out. I'm a passionate admirer of his work. What did you consider his best novel? Oh, I didn't name it, did I? I think, I think you might have a look at American Pastoral, um, which I think a lot of people think is. But in that period, um, sort of the 80s to 2001, 2002, there are five or six novels, all of which are just of absolute enduring quality, wonderful quality. And bear with me, the lights are in my eyes. So if anyone else has a, if you could raise your hand. And before your question, if you could announce who you are. There's a microphone to you, sir. To you. Graham Beatty from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, I'm not surprised, in fact, I'm delighted at your selection. Uh, he, of course, has been shortlisted several times before. Um, but how on earth three people ever reach a decision like this, having been involved in other book prize judging? I know how difficult it is. Was this a unanimous decision? Um, nice to see you, Grant. Um, three is a very difficult number, isn't it? <laughs> Those of you who have children know that if you take your daughter out with her best friend, it's going to be a good day. And if you take her out with their two best friends, it's going to be a nightmare. I don't want to say it was a nightmare, but every year, every year in this prize since 2005, it has been hotly debated amongst the judges, it's been contentious, and it hasn't been unanimous. Now, 
the chance actually of three literary people who are all well-read and highly strung coming in and coming to the same decision is negligible. You wouldn't get a bet on it at the bookies, I don't think. Therefore, you come in and what's going to happen? Uh, the answer is you have to find some way to come to a decision. And there are two possibilities. And there, in a way, there was an English election about this recently. There's the first past the post possibility, and there's the AV alternative vote possibility. My view as chairman was that if you had two judges passionately in favor of a winner and one dissenting, that that was better than having everybody saying, well, that isn't my first choice, but I suppose I could live with that. That, that writer's OK. Um, we ended up in the first position, that is, two passionate advocates, and we were lucky that we had two very passionate advocates for Philip Roth and a person who was not. So was it unanimous? No, it wasn't. It almost never is in literary prizes. I was talking to Ian Truin, who's the Man Booker literary director about this, and Ion said, I've been following the Man Booker Prize for 20 odd years. There's never been a unanimous decision. It simply doesn't happen. Um, the question is, how contentious is the lack of unanimity? And that differs from year to year. Yeah, the questions? TikTok? Hello, Rick. Josie Everson from Hi. the University of Sydney. Delighted to be here today and to see you again. Um, my question is more about the, the panel than the prize winner. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help hearing, or, or maybe I imagined it, a bit of emotion in your voice as you read through your short list of finalists and then actually announced the winner. Yep. Can you talk about the sort of emotional impact this might have had on the panel and whether it's changed the way you read or whether it's changed the way you view your shortlisted authors? Uh, great question. Um, there's an essay of Philip Roth's in a book called The Facts, in which he says, I think it's in that book, in which he says, people are claiming that writing can do lots of things. They claim it amuses you enormously, <laughs> that it makes you a better person, that it changes the world. He said, in my view, what a writer can do, and it may be the only thing they can do, is make you read better. And I thought about that. I'm not entirely sure I agree with it, but one of the results of doing this two years, and yes, it's been very emotional. There's no question about it. Um, and right across the range of emotions, there have been very difficult moments and there have been moments of utter joy. Um, I think I'm reading better than I did. I think partly more widely. Um, I think if you had come when I first took this job and said, give me a little rundown on who the great Hungarian authors are and what good is coming out of Uruguay, and, and I'm interested in Egypt, tell me about Egypt. Um, I think I would have said I had a headache, headache and gone off. Um, I can do that now. I'm not an authority on those things, but the more you read, the more you come to understand, I think, one, how, diff how different and how difficult the situations are out of which writers write. And at the same time, how similar are the things that they write about. So that in reading novels, I think two things happen simultaneously, and it's that that's so moving. One is that we get an extraordinary sense of difference in different voices, different cultures, different moments. And two, at the same time, we feel a commonality because we're people, we care about the same things, we fall in love, our parents die, our children disappoint us, One, they, they insist on going out with two friends. Um, it's a fascinating mixture, it's very heady, but the novel at its best illuminates life for us. And uh, curiously, I have in two days to be on a panel that says that reading is overrated, um, and I'm, Reading at its best is the best thing that one does. It's absolutely marvelous. Uh, has it been very emotional? Yeah, sure. Is that an answer? OK. Any other questions? From anyone in the room, from media, from any interested party? This won't be the last opportunity for Rick to discuss the Man um, Booker International Choice. We have an event tomorrow called the Final Judgment at Sydney Theatre. 
and uh, Rick and I will be in conversation about the process and we'll dig deeper into um, uh, what his, this past year has been like. Um, in past 18 months. Past 18 That's months has been years. like in narrowing down to this choice. And we also have a great privilege to, we will be showing a video that was taped just a few days ago with Philip Roth, a, a, an intense retrospective on his career. And um, that will be a major part of that event, including our conversation. So that'll be at Sydney Theater, Sydney Theater tomorrow, I believe at 11.30, if I can remember all of the 300 events, at 11.30 at Sydney Theater. So I hope you can all join us. Anne-Marie Nicholson from ABC TV. Hi, yes, Anne-Marie Nicholson. Okay, I'll ask that question. Who did the dissenting judge want to win? I don't think I should talk about that, uh, but I'd be very surprised if it didn't come out. <laughs> <laughs> Who should we ask then? <laughs> I'm not doing a gender answer because it might give something away. <laughs> Thank you, Justine. Any other questions? Going, going, gone, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in thanking Rick and coming here and making this announcement.